we're doing our best to communicate. And I will say, just as an observation, that for the 45 minutes or so that we've been together in this room, it really has been a sanctuary. For 45 minutes, I've forgotten about all the chaos that's going on in the world. And it's been a lovely and holy experience, a sacred time. So I did prepare as best I could. It, it's been a busy week. Uh, some thoughts and reflections, and maybe you're tired of hearing them as I've emailed you more than once. But these are new thoughts and reflections, at least as of this afternoon. Yesterday, I cried in my car. You shouldn't worry. I was parked at the time. But I did cry. And I share this not for sympathy or even empathy, though I know I have both and I feel your support, as I hope you feel mine for you. I share this because these are harrowing times. And we all feel the tremendous weight of worry. For ourselves, if we are relatively young, we know that the vast majority of cases are mild to moderate, but some aren't, and so we worry. If we're older, the danger increases with age, though interesting to me, as I have found, amongst many of our elders in our congregation, there is a rationalism and a calm that if I wasn't freaking out myself so much with worry, I think I would take comfort in your calm and rationalism. For our aged parents, if we still have them, and for some compounded worry that, we are, that they are beyond our reach in other cities or countries, we worry. We worry for our children as normalcy evaporates and erodes, as they feel our tension and our stress, and it comes and acts out as it did tonight around the Shabbos table. I told my children the other night as we canceled plans for my son's birthday party at the movies this weekend that he will tell his own children how they survived the pandemic of 2020. And they will. The vast, vast majority of all of us, even the aged, will survive this. But we will be forever changed by it. I hope for the better. For our city and country as it attempts to flatten the curve, I long for the days when that phrase was most often rendered in my head as I looked in the mirror at my belly or my hips. I'd say that I worry for our world as this pandemic is truly global, but the sweep of this virus is so vast that I cannot wrap my head around the whole world. Experiencing this crisis all at once, it is too much. If ever an example was given that there are no true borders, that what happens here affects people there, and vice versa, then this is that example. We've had others, of course, the refugee crisis, climate change, economic disparity, but now a global pandemic. We are all connected. There are no Chinese COVID-19 victims, or Italian victims, or Israeli victims, or Iranian victims, or American victims, or Canadian victims. There are just people, people living in different parts of the world, all with the same fears and uncertainties, all with the same worries, and indeed all with the same prayers in many different languages, prayers for healing. Just people, just human beings. There is nothing, nothing so different about us except perhaps age, which is only a matter of time, that it protects any of us more than the rest of us. And that's why I cried in my car. And I share it with you because I learned from that cathartic cry that it's okay to be scared. And it's okay to cry. Not because I did it, and I don't want to be the only one crying in my car where the kids can't see me, but because I felt a lot better after. And you might too. There was a cartoon that was being passed around on the internet. I think they call that a meme. It was about a couple looking at their computer screen. The husband was looking at his computer screen and the wife was over his shoulder and he says to her, honey, this is so funny. All of my friends on Facebook last month who were constitutional scholars, this month they're epidemiologists. I thought it was funny. I know very little about the science of all of this. Though I am trying to keep up, and Dr. Henry and our congregant Patty Daly 
and their teams are incredible in their competence and their expertise, but I know almost nothing about the science that is helpful here. And so what I would like to offer, what I think I know something about, what I think might be of help to us, is the power of prayer. Prayer not to change God, not to change the course of the virus, I wish that it could. As I wrote in my letter to the congregation, though this is a natural evil, I do not think it comes from God. I do not think it's a punishment from God or within God's control. My faith doesn't work like that. I want to suggest and to teach for a moment the power of prayer not to change God, but to change us, to change ourselves. Sarah Hurwitz, whose book, Here All Along, which I am sure you were tired of me referencing again and again, describes a form of Hasidic prayer called Hitbadadut, the word which sounds a little bit like the last name of a former Democratic presidential candidate, Hitbadadut, um, refers to a practice of self-seclusion, of Jewish meditation popularized by Reb Nachman of Bratzlo. The practice as he taught it is an unstructured, spontaneous, and individualized form of prayer and meditation through which each individual establishes a close and personal relationship with God through a free-flowing monologue. Where some people go out into the woods and make a primal scream, Jews go out into the word woods and we kvetch, we complain. Not only do we kvetch, but we thank. And we question and we plead and we wonder and we acknowledge and we unload without stopping to think or formulate our thoughts. You can just talk to God, and that is prayer. It's a stream of consciousness practice, this heat but a dut, but you don't have to give it a name. It's just talking to God. But like the cry in my car, it can be incredibly cathartic and remarkably revealing of our inner thoughts and feelings. It's not unlike that famous Jewish folk story of the young, edu uneducated shepherd who comes to the synagogue and sits in the back row to pray, but not knowing the prayers of the established liturgy, he sits in the back row and sings the Aleph Bet over and over again. Maybe he was washing his hands as he was doing it. The men of the synagogue confront him, and they say to him, Why do you disturb our prayers with this gibberish? Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalit, A. The boy explains... I don't know the prayers, but I wish to thank God for my sheep and for the stream and for the warmth of the sun and the silver moon that keeps me company when I sleep at night. I know the Aleph Bet, and so I say that. Surely God can put the letters into the correct order to make the proper prayers. In this worrying and frightening time, give voice, give actual voice to your thoughts and feelings, your fears and your anxieties, not to change God, not to stop the virus, but to change yourself, to give you insight and courage and patience and perspective and confidence and hope and calm and gratitude. In doing so, you might just find your own prayers, not those in the prayer book or on the screen, but the prayers that are deep in your soul, Go out into the woods, they tell us the virus is less communicable outside, and talk to God. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel taught, those who honestly search, those who yearn, yearn and fail, we do not presume to judge them. Let them pray to be able to pray, and if they do not succeed, if they have no tears to shed, then let them yearn for tears. Let them try to discover their heart and let them take strength from the certainty that that too is a high form of prayer. Talk to God. Cry to God. Be silent with God. It's all prayer and it all helps. I know it's helping me. I pray that it will help you as well. Shabbat Shalom. Our service continues.